Welcome to Uncomfortable, conversations about culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here today. Wow, you sound really cheerful today. Are you workshopping a song? Yeah, (laughs) I've got some albums in the works. Yeah. It sounded like a lullaby a little bit, too. Yeah. Hey, hey everybody. I mean, it's going to be stuck in my head all day. Inspirational and calming. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's the name of your radio station or your slogan for a radio <laughs> station, I think. Uh, how's everybody doing? Doing good? Doing, doing well. Is it weird when people ask you, like, how are you doing? And then they just infer that you're doing good because they don't want to hear that you're doing bad because mm-hmm. that would make things uncomfortable. But guess what podcast we're on right now? Uncomfortable. Uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, so how are we doing? Does yeah, that make us that's feel? That's what I wanted to know. I mean, I... Like we're passing in the hallway though, so don't give me like actually all the details. We're, yeah, we're just like how you doing? I mean, I've seen better days, but <laughs> doing good. <laughs> See, now you wonder why I said that. Yeah. No, what's I'll going get, on? Oh, wow, Jess, Jess, do we <laughs> need to talk about this? Mm. I would like to say, Jess, uh, I, I would like to publicly uh, thank your husband uh, for. <laughs> helping uh, my my daughter out, she was. We were sitting in front of him on Sunday oh, in church. And he, brought, he came solo, and yeah, he had, all the he had all your boys. One of them had kind of a severe cold. You may want to like get him oh, some vitamin really? C or something. They've got some, they've got some allergies. <laughs> yeah. bad. But but uh, yeah. uh, well, my daughter Maddie was him. was was knitting, and she left her scissors behind, and Ben grabbed them for. For wow. her and what returned them to uh, someone here at the church and gave them to me today. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Wow. She was wondering where they, they had been. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where you been? Where have my scissors been? <laughs> uh, wow. Anyways. Alex, do we have any voicemails this week we to do, dig us out of we this? We do have a voicemail uh, to play, and oh. here it goes. Hi, guys. Long time email renter, first time voicemailer. Listen, uh, you've been talking a lot about pop culture, and so with the recent release of Amazon's uh, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, I was wondering if you could address the question, what is the meaning of life? I'm going to hang up and listen. Thanks. (laughs) That went all over the place. That was a journey and a voicemail. It was. There and back again. I think before... Very Lord of the Rings-ish. We get to the meaning of life. Is anybody watching that? The Amazon thing. I'm, I'm saving it. Saving I have to it pay for what? I have to be able to pay attention and turn it up. Oh, okay. And I, no, I love Lord of the Rings so much. I need to. I, wait for the um, right time. But I'm excited. I'll get all the Christian shaming right now <laughs> okay. when I tell you all. I've never seen watched <laughs> Any Lord of, of the Rings. I have not. Wow. I don't. That would if I if I had known that before you asked me to be on the podcast, that would have influenced me. <laughs> there, there is a lot of. It's definitely one of those. Uh, I mean, culture wide, but like Christian culture, okay. I feel like mm-hmm. people are like, you don't know, like, yeah. how are you supposed to preach without references to Gollum and the mm-hmm. Ring and salvation and all of that? And yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's. Why I'm not a great preacher. I don't <laughs> don't refer to Lord of the Rings a lot. So that's why we're not okay. That I, that made it sound like I, I thought you were a bad preacher. I, You're not. But I saw the I don't m- movies. I saw I watched, but then I watched The Hobbit, and they broke that into three movies, which I just couldn't, he doesn't know what we're talking about. So boring. Really it was so boring. Like. I just, it was so long. Jess is like giving you a I know, dirty I'm sorry. I, I right couldn't now. get through The Hobbit. It was just too much. So I don't know that I'm really that excited for this new thing. I want to be because I feel like I'm supposed to be, but I really didn't like The Hobbit. And that like, and I don't think, not saying that these are related. <gasps> I'm just saying that my capacity for Lord of the Rings got like used up, like burnt out by The Hobbit. And so I'm worried that I don't have the capacity for this. I feel like I loved the... Lord of the Rings, and I also enjoyed The Hobbit. I see what you're saying, but we'll say I. So that all was, that to me the is book separate. Was like the, and the the little, Rings of Power to me is completely separate from it. Just, so I'm almost like nervous. Do you know what it's covering then? Like, is it just diving deeper into the like? Is it all new? I stories? think it's diving into what the meaning of life is from this. Oh, okay. If we're if we've if we're, not seen it, but I'm going off this voicemail. Mm-hmm. There we go. 
the rings of power, it's what's the meaning of life. And so I, I'm going to go with the first thing that I thought. Of. What's the meaning of life, Jess? Uh, I thought of like that catechism. What's man's chief end? Kind of say, I don't know, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's mm. like the same. Is that a Christian y thing for you, Alex, that's, for that's Lord Christian-y. of the Rings stuff? <laughs> and actually, I. Uh, Were you thinking the same I thing? I have a catechism thought. As well, because mm. mostly because Wednesdays we go, th- we're doing the New City Catechism, so Ooh. I would rec- highly recommend it uh, for kids. But it is, uh, what is our, what is the purpose, uh, what is our, what is the purpose in life and death that we are not our own but we belong to God? That is mm. the that is the mm. purpose of life and death in the New City Catechism for kids. So our kids have memorized that question and the answer. And so I feel like I'd be failing them if if, if, if they listen it. to this. And because my I've, kids listen to this weekly. Oh, do they? And make them suffer. No, not at all. <laughs> if it ever like pops on, they're just not a fan. Yeah. So. Okay, but even that response, I probably learned at your your kids' ages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it sticks. It does. Yeah. All right. Well, Eric, I don't. I don't have an answer for I the f- meaning I of life. Like, I'm not gonna fall into that trap. I Sorry, feel like we're gonna, gonna know because this person sounds like they'll let us know. Yeah. If we didn't answer that well. I. I mean, I guess it's to watch the new Lord of the Rings series on Amazon, sponsored by Goodyear Motor. I don't know. It's just. I don't even want to go into the rabbit trail we could get into of asking Alex what movies he hasn't seen because that's. I do have Amazon though, and maybe I'll maybe I'll watch it. Uh, that maybe would be I'll interesting. Watch for someone that's never watched from Lord there. of the Rings to start mm-hmm. with Rings of Power. Because obviously people will. I'm I mean, curious. if it's a new release thing, yeah. it's on Amazon and streaming. So maybe people will start there and then we'll, we'll have a, a fan. A, do a whole review episode of it. I think it's the amount of time. Game. Like it's one of those, I think the movies are very long mm-hmm. and I'm not a movie person anyway. Yeah. So to sit down for three hours for me and watch that is that's just like never one well, movie. people would argue exactly it's an, it's an experience and so, so. maybe Let's if i watch off. maybe if it's uh 45 minutes mm-hmm. and i i get in so there because i can get guy. sucked in i, I, I can for see. sure get sucked in but a really? three hour first time commitment to an experience that's probably the thing that's kept me you're, away so you're from, casual mm-hmm. yeah dipping your toes in yeah. all right i mean you could break the movie up you could watch but that's here. something I can't right. do either. Oh. So like I'm okay. one of the people that I can't stop in the middle of an episode. Oh, okay. Um, and so binging gets me. We're getting badly. really deeply into yeah, this. Yeah, sorry. My <laughs> wife hates it because like she's like, we'll wa- would, we'll be watching I a show, and she's like, I'm so tired right now, and I'm like, I can't. And she's like, you can't watch it without me. Then I'm like, you're gonna stay up and watch this, <laughs> well, or I'll screenshot where we're at, and you can watch it tomorrow because I can't fall asleep. So. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'll usually just do that. I'll let her fall asleep and I'll finish it. I used to, like we used to almost get into arguments over it. It's not worth it. That's the meaning of life. Don't get into <laughs> petty arguments. That is true. Yeah, that's there. It is. Amen. All Done. All right. Uh, coming up next, we got headlines. Our first headline comes from wwt.com. It says McDonald's is coming out with Happy Meals for adults. Who's excited? Wow. Oh, so any <laughs> does anyone go to McDonald's on the reg? Nobody. <laughs> it I'm, depends what the toys are. Nobody does. So like po- Okay. I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm, I'm always reminded of, <laughs> about there's a comedian, Jim Gaffigan, mm-hmm. and and I'm not what? this is not a recommendation for him, but he mm. does have a joke about McDonald's where he's like Nobody, you know, it's just funny. Nobody says they go to McDonald's. Like yeah. nobody ever says they go there. But somehow they serve six billion hamburgers every single day. Yeah. But like, if you get caught at McDonald's, it's like people feel yeah. ashamed. So anyway, uh, yes, we we go to McDonald's. Mm-hmm. We do, we do. We we also pay attention to when because last month was Pokemon. Mm-hmm. So we had to go weekly. I'm trying to think. I just get the net the new. We rarely go to McDonald's, but my kids will go ask for it. And then occasionally, I would say maybe one to two times a year we go to McDonald's. Is that is that below average probably then? Yeah, I would say. It's probably below average. Probably depending what what part of the country you're in. Yeah, I, I mean, like. there's probably more McDonald's per square feet in some areas of the country. Mm. And probably how close you live to one, obviously. But, yeah, the toys do something like that when there's, like, Pokemon yeah, toys that's what, that's or something like that. We'll kind of maybe be, mm-hmm. like, more interested. But now 
adults wow can get in on the f- fun it says uh there's nothing more iconic in the realm of fast food culture other than mcdonald's happy meal the meals sold by the fast food chain contain uh hamburger or nuggets for kids but get this if you're an adult uh <laughs> you get to choose between a big mac or a 10 piece <laughs> chicken mcnugget <laughs> with fries a drink and a toy of course uh, what would you get the nugs or the okay, I, big I, mac. I don't oh the i, I have the two yeah that's the, i i'm not a fan of like the big mac in general like the extra bread the big the mac sauce, sauce. Like okay. I'm not, i just don't really like any of that so i probably would go with the nuggets if i had mm. to mm-hmm. normally if i go to mcdonald's i'm like get, i get like a mcdouble or something like that if i'm getting a burger but the once once a year treat yeah, yeah i'm more of a, a double quarter pounder oh okay, okay. Yeah. so you're, you're yeah. going Going for going the big, the get that protein. elite meat that they have <laughs> okay, there. Okay, definitely never frozen. Uh-huh. Always mm, fresh. Mm. Mm. I usually get my kids up happy meal, and I'll get like an iced tea or something. Yeah, I'm not. I, I mean, I guess if I get something, it'll be like a McChicken. Yeah, my grandma loves McDonald's, mm. so she likes the old McRib. Anyways, but I will say, look up Big Mac salad because I even made it last night. You like mix up your own sauce, but it's healthy version of a Big Mac. No mm. bread. I, it's not something I crave. You know, it's not like, mm, well, how can I make <laughs> this into a healthy like you, thing? I don't know. Big no, Mac it's really, salad. It's really good. I'm telling you. Wait, is it? If you've had okay. it. Okay. I, I have you, to. If you know, I'm you know. sorry. I wasn't going to go there, but what on earth is Big Mac salad? <laughs> is it, <laughs> it's like, a salad. Like you, I mean, give let, us the like ingredients. a ton of, le- a bunch of lettuce. Okay. okay. And then yeah. you, I'm like brown some hamburger and like put some, some seasoning so in there. So actual meat in it. Okay. Yeah. And then I chop up like onion. You can put mm-hmm. pickles in it, and then you make your own sauce out of it's like mayonnaise, French. Yeah, I was thinking like a thousand French, island type of thing. Um, mm-hmm. The French salad dressing. Mm. Put a little vinegar in there. And you just it. mix it's, it all together. Yeah. Do you it's cut up bread so croutons? Or nope. What's the bread? No carbs. There's no no carbs. You can put oh. cheese. Okay. Some cheese. That's no carbs. Either. So it's like it's, it's so so good. The keto. As a salad, it's really refreshing. Big Mac salad. Yep. I even I made it last night. So I almost said Adkins, but then I realized that shows my age. That was the that was the keto of my you know, the, the older generations. <laughs> they called it Adkins, and it was the same thing. It but. was it was good. I think that <laughs> these toys look a little creepy in in the. Yeah, I don't know the photo the that they have, have in this like article. I look. If it's like yeah. a double negative, but I think it would be fun if they put toys in from when we were kids. Yeah, that's true. So this, this is like idea. the Grimace and Hamburglar and a couple other McDonald's yeah, characters. I'm not some OG characters familiar with. So culturally, I would say in my lifetime, McDonald's has had the corner of the market on best toys. Mm. You know, and oh, I yeah. think for sure they've always had the best partnerships and probably mm-hmm. the most relevant cultural kind of oh, toys. Sure. Compl- I mean, uh, hands and, down. and quality too. Hands down. Alex. Then you always got like Chick Fil A trying to do educational toys. Give me a break. Nope. Don't they have books that. and some of their books. Okay, from uh, uh, you doing some from light my reading. perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy their books. You en- okay. enjoy the Chick Fil A children's <laughs> books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they as far as diversity. So they they have a book currently right now, which kind of leads into. Our conversation today that is about inclusion and has oh, okay. uh, someone with cochlear implants. And I, so from that side of things, for me, okay. I took that as you were just that. like enjoying their books, <laughs> that's like, yeah, the literature. Too. Like <laughs> I've got a whole stack <laughs> yeah, in my that's office. What I no. took that as. Okay, that's cool. That is cool. Uh, let's let's move on to the next headline. The next headline comes from CNN.com. It says John Cena breaks Make a Wish record after granting six hundred and fifty wishes. Can't see him. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's like his you thing. Can't you can't see me. Can't see. This is oh, an actor, wrestling legend, uh, and perpetual meme subject. <laughs> John Cena has completed a new accomplishment, breaking the world record for the most wishes granted through the Make a Wish Foundation. Cena has granted 650, according to a that's news cool. release from a nonprofit organization. So blows everyone out of the water like yeah. i think they said the next highest one was 200 oh really so he's lapping people in wow make a wish i love john cena he seems like so much he it's just like when you see him in interviews and then you see him in the roles that he has in movies and tv he just yeah he kind of just has that aura about him like yeah. oh he just seems like a good guy someone that you'd want to hang out with yeah we have he has uh-huh. kids books my um, brother-in-law. 
no, no. Oh, okay. My brother-in-law um, sells wrestling action figures on whatnot. I don't know if you guys have ever been on that app, but I mm. love it. It's like live auction. And Phoenix Resell that we had on oh. the podcast a couple months ago yeah. is on there. He does like live auctions. It's so fun to watch. But They pay him a lot of money, that's for uh, sure. My son got to pick a couple action figures from my brother-in-law, and I thought he was getting John Cena for himself because he got to pick out some wrestling figures. But Gavin actually got it for me, <laughs> and he put it up on our windowsill in the kitchen so I can see like John Cena and his... Yeah, it's like a guardian angel at your house. <laughs> I, I mean, Cena. I could truly post a picture. Uh, he is on my window seal. We'll be looking on just your wa- be real watching me for that. <laughs> oh yeah, I should. I'll I'll do that next time. I hope next time your be real notification comes in, you're hanging out with John Cena. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I just will. it's just so neat to see a person of his stature and fame actually like kind of paying it forward. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, you don't. You know when it, when that's when you're the person that a kid is looking up to, and that can make the whole difference. And I, I it's cool to see that he's probably looking at this like, yeah, this is a lot, but it's something I could, just my presence can you know really make a, tr- a dream come true for mm-hmm. someone. And then to be able to do that and leverage your celebrity status mm-hmm. is is really cool. And part of it, I mean, says that Cena is the celebrity children most often request to meet. And I don't know if that if that's just mm. I don't know specifically how it all works. I know people that have have been granted wishes but if you just get a pick from anywhere or if there's like hey here's a select people that we're partnering with uh yeah. kind of thing because i don't i don't know that in my my kids probably would pick john cena if they could pick out of everybody they would probably they pick? pick a ninja kid a ninja kid oh, a ninja kid yeah. I don't, yeah. is that a series if you or know something? you it's know it's a youtube yeah oh, there's, okay. it's a youtube family oh okay yeah and good <laughs> clean right. fun it is good clean it, fun i mean that's really this this girl, I don't know what her name is. Okay, she, now we're gonna go into an episode that you watched. <laughs> no, she she's like parodied all these songs and yes. come up with an album, and it's, it's like it's sweet, but it's rough. Yeah. It's like you know, really rough. But Ninja Kid, all right, mm. wow. yeah. Once my kids know I talked about Ninja Kids, they're, they're gonna, gonna listen. Be, they're no. gonna listen now just for this moment. <laughs> Big time. Oh, well, anyways. that's a, that's your feel good story of the week. Uh, up next, Alex, you got an opportunity to sit down with Colin and Alco uh, to just have a conversation about deaf culture. So stay tuned for that. September is Deaf Awareness Month, and so this month we wanted to have a conversation with. Uh, a member of our deaf community here at Christ Community Church and just grateful for the ministry. And uh, we've gotten to work together quite a bit uh, just because I get to preach and he gets to voice it and preach in his own way to our deaf community, which is a beautiful thing. And so we're grateful for that. So I did enough talking. Colin, will you introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. So my name is Colin. I'm here with my wife. She is doing the voice interpretation for me. Her name is June. So a little bit about myself. I was born in Michigan. I do have a twin brother. I also have a older sister as well. Uh, My parents are hearing, my sister is hearing, my brother and I are deaf. So my parents started to notice early on, I'd say probably when we were about six months, that we were not responsive to sound, we weren't making any babbling noises, et cetera, et cetera. And they started to really notice that disparency. So they just assumed that we were deaf. I believe the hair in our ears just dissipated. There was something that was confirmed through the medical community. Our parents are educators, so they went ahead and started to research what does it look like to have deaf children? What's the best decision for us and our family? And what we decided together as a family was that sign language was the best thing for us to learn together. And that was probably the huge and biggest blessing that we've ever had. Several years later, we moved to Indiana. Uh, Several more years later, I met and fell in love with my beautiful wife and the rest is history. Awesome. So where do you work? What do you do in life right now? Yeah. So fast forward several years to currently. We live in Nebraska. 
and I work for Deaf Missions. It, that organization actually is located in Council Bluffs. Deaf Missions is a nonprofit organization, and their goal is to share the gospel of Jesus through their heart language of ASL. They also do that using media content as well. We translated the very first Bible into American Sign Language, very similar to what the hearing community has, like the NIV Bible and all of the different Bible translations that are out there. So I was originally hired to work with Deaf Missions as a Bible translator. I um, interpreted the book of Ezekiel and Proverbs myself. That project was finished in 2020. And as the company restructured and changed positions, I transferred into the content coordinator position. I do a lot of filming. We are right now preparing for the Jesus film, and that is going to be a film we're starting in 2023 that it's going to be primarily in American Sign Language to share the story of Jesus with deaf individuals. It's definitely going to be one of a kind. That's awesome. I think you showed our staff maybe a, a clip from that. Oh, yes. So that was the pilot, actually. That was uh, more so a test for us to kind of see what it looks like if we were to do the full story of Jesus in ASL. And that pilot was created to start the fundraising for that project. Obviously, there's um, a lot of funds needed to do a movie in ASL. And yeah, it's, we're ready to get started soon. It was beautiful. I, I agree. It was beautifully done. So that pilot scene that we did, it was called Uncondemned. And that was, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we're here. We are sinners. We make mistakes. You know, there's a lot of frustrations that we have in life through that sinful nature. And a lot of people don't know God. They don't know Jesus. And they tend to fall down that rabbit hole until they realize oh, I need to know Jesus. All of the things in my life, there's nothing that I can do that is so wrong that Jesus would not love me. So unfortunately, that clip, Uncondemned, will not actually be in the main story of the book of Jesus, but it definitely was a beautiful story. So why is it important for uh, a Bible in American Sign Language what does access to the gospel look like for people in the deaf community? Why is this important, the work that you do uh, to be able to access? Are there any stats or anything you want to share? Yes, absolutely. So all over the world, I believe there is over 150 to 200 million deaf people all over the world. And I would say the statistics are about 2% of people who know Jesus. So really that's the biggest unreached people group. So to give you a visual, in 2020, the first ASL version, it's called ASLV, of the Bible was translated in American Sign Language, the very first. There's a lot of other projects that were started. I don't believe any of them today were finished in any signed language other than ASL. So it's very important for people to know that access in their sign language, in their heart language is out there. So, I mean, some people have a misconception, why can't they just read the English version? And I want you to understand that ASL, American Sign Language, is deaf people's native language. It's quote unquote their mother tongue. They understand it with their heart. It's visual they can understand how they can express themselves, how they can learn and how they can grow through that visual language. So ASLV, that translation speaks to the heart of those people. They just find Jesus's love through that. And so far the gospel, if they never have access to that and they never understand and know that Jesus loves them and they were created for a purpose, To understand the Bible, they would have to first understand it through the context of a language that's not direct to them. Gosh, how sad that is. So translating the Bible into American Sign Language is very important, and other signed languages as well, for movies, for the Bible, for anything. And deaf missions, 
they're doing right now some filming in Stanzanza. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Stanzanza. Yes. Stanzania. Excuse me. This is my um, my bad geography. <laughs> So they're doing some signed dubs right now. So that movie, Uncondemned, they're using a green screen and using some footage from the Uncondemned video, and they're replacing the actors with their own actors and their own sign language in that country to tell that story in their sign language to reach their people. So that's why it is so important to reach deaf people all over the world. And that 2% of people knowing Jesus is not enough. It's not enough. We can't do that. We can't reach enough people with that. So mm, That's powerful. And something I think a lot of people don't know. So going off of the importance of ASL, why not just reading the Bible, but why not just close caption everything or lip read everything? What are, what are some of the importances of having that heart language as you described um, for the Bible or even other forms of content, why not just close caption a sermon but have you interpret it? Can you help us understand that a little more? Yes. So first, let me go ahead and tackle that misconception of lip reading because that's very important. So when some people ask, can you read lips? Or are you good at lip reading? No, I would say it's more so a guessing game because 70%, and I might be wrong roughly, but I believe about 70 or 60% of sound is actually pronounced in the back of the tongue. So if that is true, how can I see it? So if only about 30% of what you say is understandable and visual from the front of the tongue, that's huge. So to have that kind of a layer added onto communication, it is very impertinent. So for example, let's say there's a table full of people and people are talking back and forth. There's a lot of going back and forth, turn taking. It's often a big misunderstanding that it's very easy. I mean, I would be completely out if that would be the case. So closed caption Again, that is an option that is out there, but not necessarily all people understand English 100%. You know, they might not even have an understanding of English. They might come from another country and moved here to America and then learn sign language. So it's not always people's first language. And people don't often even think in English. They express themselves in ASL. Some people think in ASL. So most deaf people like I said, they're visual learners. They learn visually. And through that language, trying to receptively understand English as an information, they have to now translate in their head, okay, this is what they're saying, but this is really what they mean. And that's really exhausting. So when deaf people see either something interpreted or something visually in their language, it's almost like watching a movie. They can understand it clearly. It takes a lot of the power that they feel. It takes a lot of the work out of the guesswork out of it. And they no longer have to invest their energy on thinking about translating in my head, change it to another language. So really ASL is the best way to reach deaf people, the best way to make that connection. So I want to know, since most of the listeners and people at, at maybe even Christ community are a part of the hearing community. How do we start to build bridges and start to learn to serve and understand and become brothers and sisters more closely with those uh, family members in the deaf community? That's a great question. So really, I would say, obviously, the best suggestion is to learn sign language, right? <laughs> That's number one. You can't go wrong if you learn the language. It's definitely the fastest way to connect. And, you know, we deaf people, we don't bite. We're patient. We are very willing with individuals who are learning sign language to, to teach. 
excited to build that connection. You know, I know individuals who don't know a language might feel very timid or shy or that it's a daunting experience, but that's probably the best way. So let's say you were to come across a deaf person, you know, be ready to maybe gesture, try to visually get across what you're trying to say, maybe pull out a piece of paper and a pen to get your your thoughts across, or maybe even learn something very simple, like the sign for good morning. You know, here, when you come to church, you know, if someone, let's say, for example, they didn't know who I was, they didn't know the I, who I was deaf, and they might have spoken good morning, but I signed back good morning to them. You know, I think that's probably the first thing people would normally say when you walk into a door is they would speak good morning. So if a hearing person would sign good morning back to me, oh my goodness, it would make my day. It would make me feel like I'm welcome. This is home for me. So, and I would be very surprised. Oh, they know sign language here. So it would not be a constant reminder that here I am, a deaf person in a hearing church with people who don't know sign language are not willing to connect with me. They're not willing to invest in my life. So if the very first person in the building who were who would be willing to greet me in ASL, I think that would just be, you know, the first and biggest step. And like I said, baby steps goes a long way. And I know personally, part of it is fear, right? It's not a fear of people, but fear of the unknown and being wrong and failing. And so I can say, like, I've personally had some of those fears, but had to slowly get over them in my own story. And I've had several conversations, coffee with your brother to try to help me understand, you know, better. And so I just want to affirm that you don't bite (laughs) and it is a loving community and I'm grateful for that. Uh, So what are some encouragements, um, just practical things to, to do to interact with people in the deaf community? You said, that good morning can go a long way, but are there just ways to say address the deaf community or are there things to never do or just to help people feel more inclusive? Maybe someone can't learn ASL. They're 80 years old. Learning a language is tough, but what are things that we can do with the knowledge we have? Or or don't do. <laughs> yes. So I definitely appreciate your comment about saying that sometimes it's fearful because I think sometimes we don't realize that it's fear is what holding is what's holding most people back. You know, we just view people as maybe insensitive or arrogant, thinking that they are better than us, or maybe they don't have time for us as a deaf community. So I think deaf people understanding and hearing that comment might be very powerful to them as well. So they can help to bridge that gap. So thank you for explaining that. But, you know, fear, we all make mistakes every single day. You know, we learn from our mistakes, we grow from our mistakes. And if we don't make mistakes, then how are we growing? So letting people make those mistakes, learning from it, I think that's the grace, the greatest thing. I think one thing that comes to mind, well, I shouldn't say never, but often I hear people call deaf in the deaf community hearing impaired. That's a huge no, no, because as the deaf community, we don't identify ourselves as impaired. You know, that's the medical view of deafness that we are, there's something wrong with us. We need to be fixed. And we realize that we are human beings. We can be independent. We, you know, our, our ears don't necessarily work like others, but we're not broken as people. You know, the deaf and hard of hearing community definitely understands um, that calling us deaf. That's, you know, it's prideful. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, is don't assume that we all can lip read. Don't assume that we all can talk. Some deaf people did grow up um, learning how to speak and talk as well. Some people, you know, have made comments to them saying, oh, I would have never assumed that you were deaf because you speak so well. But unfortunately, that's not the majority of deaf people. But there is definitely a misconception there. So when I recommend 
hearing people try to connect with deaf people, often I get met with a lot of people who look like a deer in headlights. <laughs> you know, like I said, we all bleed red. We're, we're the same. You know, I mean, I don't, you're good looking. I don't necessarily look like you, but you know, we're the same. We're the same um, inside. So how to figure out how to communicate. Yes, you might make mistakes. Yes, there might be some oops moments. I might sign something that looks a little funny, but through all of that, that's where the connection comes in at. You know, it's, it definitely isn't met if someone is very fearful to even try. And, you know, in that moment, if someone doesn't know what to do at all, the best thing you can do is just smile. You know, give a thumbs up. That kind of is universal for you. Good. <laughs> I'd say simple things like that. I mean, are there any specific things that you're thinking of that I can kind of help? I know in what you mentioned hearing impaired or when we see things that we see as maybe impairments, sometimes in the church, one of the things we like to do because we read in scripture is we see Jesus healed blind or Jesus healed those who are deaf. And so how do we, how should we approach that as a a faith community that believes Jesus can do that, but also in a community that wants to value people and how God has wired us. Yes. Uh, Amen to that. (laughs) That was a good point that you brought up. Um, There actually was a situation that we experienced. Um, There was a a couple here who had wanted to go ahead and pray for a deaf person's hearing ability. And unless that deaf person has specifically said, please pray for my hearing ability, don't do it. But let's not just jump and, and assume that they want to be healed. Can you see how offensive that would be to a deaf community or a deaf person who has pride in who they are? Let's say, you know, they're bringing their baby. For example, there was a deaf person here who had brought their baby up to the front of the stage for some prayer and that someone jumped in and and started to pray for the deaf parents and pray for their hearing ability and and pray for that to be healed. Um, And that was pretty detrimental to them. But here, the deaf community has so much rich culture and a beautiful identity and yet it gets overlooked sometimes to um, be, pray for that hearing part and that hearing portion to be healed. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Another thing I just thought of as well is let's say a deaf person has their family with them. And there might be maybe a mixed group of, of members. Some of them can hear, some of them cannot you know, sometimes in the deaf community, there's, you know, an entire deaf family. There's a deaf family with just one deaf member. There's a lot of variety within our community. But let's say there's one deaf member and the rest of the, the family members can hear. So if you're coming up to them and you're saying hello, and you might just mainly speak to the children or mainly speak to the individual who can hear, but not necessarily even give a second thought to the person who is deaf because you know that they can't hear you. It almost feels very rejecting. Like, okay, so I'm not part of this family. Is It's very demoralizing to feel left out. And that has happened to us, unfortunately, here in the church. Or possibly someone has walked up to us and talked to our children who can hear and has said, hey, can you tell him? Can you ask him? And I was standing right there. And You know, if you maybe have an interpreter with you or a family member who can hear, you talk directly to the deaf person and you don't even need to add those, you know, pronouns. Can you ask him, ask her, et cetera, et cetera. Just like you and I are having this conversation right now, you and I are talking. It's not necessarily, you know, the interpreter is just the conduit of communication. I know sometimes the interpreter in the middle of that situation feels very um, angry for the deaf person because they often understand that barrier. So that was another thing that kind of just popped to my mind as well. Thank you. That's helpful. So one of the ways that we learn in culture is through movies often. And over the last year, there was a a movie that won a lot of awards uh, called Coda, which for those that don't know, uh, you can explain maybe what what that is. Um, And then if you saw the movie and maybe your thoughts on misperceptions, things that are good from that, because for me watching that and those that don't know, I have a a daughter who is deaf. 
there's people as I'm learning the culture that have misconceptions just from watching the movie. And some grew. Some people had a better understanding from watching the movie as well, just of the differences and struggles that might happen. Uh, so maybe share your thoughts on on that. Absolutely. So first, I am very glad that that movie, you know, one is out there, two has won awards, three has brought sign language into the light. I think you know, more people wanted to watch the Oscar award-winning movie after it won all of those awards. And that is amazing. As always, every movie, you know, comes with the highs and the lows, right? There's some good things that came out of it. There's some, maybe some misunderstandings, et cetera, et cetera. So specifically with that movie, so let me really clarify. So CODA is the meaning of child of a deaf adult, so it typically is a child who is either born biologically or adopted through parents who are deaf, either one or both parents who are deaf. So when deaf parents have a hearing child, obviously their first language is to include them in with American Sign Language. You know, they might have other siblings who can hear, and that's how they learn to speak English or through school several years later when they first start school, but primarily their first language is American Sign Language. So the movie was actually written by a hearing author, and she really framed the movie in a hearing perspective, not necessarily saying that she was 100% right in how she represents, how the deaf community is represented, but more so of how she saw how the deaf community was represented. So that's kind of the first misconception. So for example, there was like the deaf fishermen, how they would communicate with each other. You know, of course, you know, that might happen, that might not happen, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> there might be a tug between, you know, deaf individuals and music, but some deaf people love music. Some deaf people, it's not so much their cup of tea, you know, but they're not mad or angry about it. Those are some things in the movie. So that movie is actually really the main star of it is the coda. And it's really about the journey of how she is trying to figure out her place in the world, loving music, but coming from a family who can't fully understand and appreciate her love of the music. And she is nervous that her family will not fully ever understand a part of her. So you mentioned the 1950s and the 60s. So yes, deaf parents did rely on their children to interpret for them out there. And that is a part of CODA that some people, if you've watched the movie, you'll see that, that there was a lot of reliance for the daughter to interpret for the parents, whether that be at a doctor's appointment or whether that be at um, a video phone call or something that needs to be made, they would ask their parent that they would ask their child to call on behalf of the parents. Today, that doesn't necessarily happen so much because a lot of technology has been developed. But in very rural areas of the U.S. where there's like two and 300 sheep and that's your neighbors for miles and miles around, there's no access to interpreters. So yes, that might still be happening to today. But on the East Coast and a more of an urban environment, you wouldn't necessarily see that happening a lot these days in our current reality of what, 2022. <laughs> so that was a little bit of a misunderstanding as well. So the concept was right maybe 30 to 40 years ago, but not today. So now I would say, you know, if there was a daughter who was fascinated by music, you know, there was more of an understanding to let the daughter go through her journey because she was not necessarily needed by the parents to interpret a doctor's appointment or the law issue that happened um, in the movie. So if you think about it from the perspective of 30 to 40 years ago, I mean, children were what, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old interpreting for their parents for medical terminology and things like that. So, but I think so far that's the only thing I'm kind of thinking of the parallel for the movie. If you want, if you want to kind of dive in deeper. Give me a specific question. No, I think that's good. And it's just helpful for 
those who are fully ignorant to maybe deaf culture to say, how accurate is this? What's wrong about it? What would you say are other resources, maybe other movies or um, books to read that would maybe give uh, a more accurate uh, depiction of what that looks like for um, someone in the hearing community to understand? I think this listening to this is one step in that right direction to build empathy, to hear a story, to realize some of these things, but do you have other resources you would, you would suggest? I'm trying to think, oh goodness, it's the end of the day. I'm not sure if I can think of resources. (laughs) Um, We can definitely maybe add a link um, to this podcast if I think of some in the future. But one thing that I just wanted to challenge you on, do you think resources would really help you to understand our community or actually getting involved with our community would probably be the best way to understand us, to really build that relationship experience that beats any suggestion that a movie or a book is going to give you? And when you start to rely on those resources saying, but wait a minute, this book said this, but that's not what I'm seeing here. Or this book said that. And you know, that's not what I'm feeling when I encounter the deaf community. You'll definitely start to understand why I'm suggesting that. And there's definitely a different perspective in there. So that's good. And I know we have, um, a class that we often offer here taught by Milton and we can put that in the show notes. Yes. That's in sign language on, Perfect. on how to just start learning sign if you don't have the money to go to a college or whatever. But I would assume YouTube also, there's plenty of different places on YouTube to be able to learn. (laughs) Yes. So you want to be careful with what you see on YouTube. There are a lot of people that are being botched on YouTube. Really, I would say is to do your research. I would say maybe find an app Yes, a YouTube channel that's actually run by a deaf individual. It's operated by someone who lives and breathes the deaf culture. Unfortunately, a lot of signers on YouTube, they're, it's not their native language. There's a lot of wrong signs that are put out there. And then when, once that individual learns those signs and then interacts with the deaf community, they're like, where did you learn that? You know, So I wouldn't necessarily suggest you to verify that you know YouTube. But definitely look for a platform that is um, deaf-based. That would probably be the best. I wouldn't say follow hearing people on how you're learning the language. Yeah. So again, do your research. And also, I think after this podcast, too, we can also add some links in there of um, some places that I can go ahead and add where hearing people can attempt to start learning. Great. Last question, just for someone who maybe attends Christ Community and sees our 1045 service and watches you or another member of the deaf community sign, maybe they don't always realize how the interpretation process goes. So could you just help us just understand if we see that, what's working? How is this happening? Yes. So let me see. There's two things that I want to tell you. So there are interpreters and there might be an interpreter interpreting on stage. They are typically going through what they hear and then interpreting that into American Sign Language. So I'm a deaf interpreter. So typically when you see me on the stage, you will also see an interpreter who can hear sitting down in the seat feeding me, quote unquote feeding me, it's what it's called. So we both as a team have worked together. We pre-read the script We have prepared for what's going on. And you might wonder, like, what is going on? Why is it going through two or three people? So let's say, for example, you have to call Verizon or you have to call, you know, the Sprint or something. You might hear a person who has like a very strong accent on the line. And you're like, oh, can you say that again, please? What did you say? Then, you know, you might they might ask you some questions and you're really struggling really hard to understand what that person is saying because English is not their first language that kind of gives you a little bit of a parallel to using a deaf interpreter. So in general, interpreters maybe take roughly five, six years worth of language, might take another two, three, four years to actually get, you know, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in that field, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not typically native signers. 
So they are very similar to those who have just moved here to America. They have an accent, you know, the parallel that I was trying to give you about calling Verizon, et cetera, et cetera. So the accent is this, the same, you know, interpreters are not, interpreters are not native language users. You know, there might be a sign choice that they used wrong or a sign that they produced wrong. And uh, it's very evident from the deaf community. So when we have a deaf interpreter on stage working with a team of hearing interpreters, we are able to get the language barriers, those quote unquote accents, worked out a lot faster. So again, we work as a team with the interpreter who is on the floor versus the one who's on the stage. And the deaf community is able to hear and understand without the struggle. That's great. I know for me, one struggle I had was actually writing out a manuscript before and then learning, hey, this is helpful for people to be able to read it and maybe weird names or geography ahead of time is able to help serve those who are in our deaf community. And so uh, it was one of those things I've Definitely. had to learn. <laughs> so it's not always the most accurate, probably. I go off script a little bit. No, no, you do a great job. <laughs> Sometimes you might go off script. That's even better, actually, because that's real, right? Yeah. I love that, too. Great. Well, thank you so much for being a part of our community, for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, I'm hopeful that people left this conversation wanting more uh, to be a part of the community. And we've built a bridge here at Christ Community where we have less fear and we're embracing one another, loving one another more uh, and doing God's kingdom work. So thanks for helping us with that. Absolutely. Amen to that. Thank you so much for having us here that we're able to go ahead and show that, that God is definitely, he is the bridge. There's no barriers. Yep. That's really who he is. So it's a wonderful opportunity to show that. Thank you. Amen. Well, hey, thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you've got any questions, you can go ahead and send them to podcast at cccomaha.org. You can follow us on TikTok, Instagram at CCC OMA podcast, or you can call that phone number, leave a voicemail that we talked about way earlier in the banter. But until next time, we'll talk to you then.